Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Rick Bayan, who's one of the top direct response marketers. He's an award-winning advertising copywriter and author whose works include the popular business reference book. If you haven't heard of it, you have to get it. Words that sell. It sold over 300,000 copies, probably using the same tactics and things that he has in the book, and which we'll hear about. And his advertising has energized the marketing efforts of two established companies and helped in periods of explosive growth. He also wrote more words that sell, the Cynics Dictionary, and extremely dark chocolates. So we'll get a glimpse into his dark humor, which from looking at you, you don't seem like a dark humor, but we hear about it. Rick, thanks for joining me. Glad to be here. And I always like to start with a fun fact before we can get to, you know, copywriting, words that sell, and everything else. Um, you have some interesting fun facts, and one of them is you do a fantastic impression of someone famous. Yeah, well, I've always been fascinated by early voice recordings of famous people. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I first discovered these, it was just mind blowing. I mean, they have, you know, recordings not only of Edison, but people like Florence Nightingale and uh, uh, Robert Browning and uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson. But my favorite has to be Theodore Roosevelt. Because uh, you expect him to have a you know, sort of a deep chested, you know, burly quality to his voice, and he actually sounds something like this. The principles for which we stand are the principles of fair play and a square deal for every man and every woman in the United States. He had that aristocratic quality. <laughs> and you could tell that at one point he was a 97-pound weakling. He, he built himself up from there. <laughs> when I heard that, I had to have you yeah. do it. So thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, you know, I want to go back to find out your journey, your path a little bit, and mm -hmm. growing up. And what was, uh, what was your childhood like? Where'd you grow up? Well, I grew up in New Brunswick, New Jersey, sort of on the fringes of town. A uh, nice you know, suburban enclave. It was, it was a kind of leave it to beaver childhood. You know, the, the Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations, uh, to totally different era. And uh, I always claim that a happy childhood is a setup for a lifetime of <laughs> cynicism and disillusionment. Because... You know, growing up, everybody was just so kind and caring and fun. And, you know, I mean, you just, I just trusted everybody. And then, you know, once I got out into the real world, it was a whole other story. So when did you <laughs> discover the real truth, the real world? After graduating from college, I took my education very seriously. I'd been a history major, and then I picked up a master's in journalism. And I thought they'd be rolling out the red carpet for me. I mean, yeah, I was a good writer already at that point, and it was just mind-boggling. You know, I'd go through the New York Times want ads and see, uh, you know, want ads for college grad typist, you know, anything under editorial. I mean, it was just, you know, the most rudimentary kind of uh, you know, entry-level positions. I th and you know, I didn't realize at that point that the best jobs were given out through the grapevine. And so I'd just be pouring over these ads. Finally, I got started in uh, trade magazines. But my first job was assistant editor of Rubber Age. <laughs> that, was a, uh, that was about the Fascinating. It sounds yeah, just yeah. <laughs> the most exciting topic you could write on. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, uh, you know, Goodyear just opened a new plant in uh, Malaysia. <laughs> and I'd write a short article about that. Then I went on from there to... Uh, uh, an industrial real estate magazine, same company. It was called Plant Sites and Parks. Now, the only redeeming uh, feature of that job was I had a boss who was an old-time New York newspaper editor named Finnegan, and I loved the guy. He was it was it was a taskmaster, but you know I, I could just remember sitting at the typewriter. We used to use regular old manual typewriters in those days, and he said, "Make it sing, Ricky boy, make it sing." <laughs> I would. It and, sounds like a boxing coach. It's almost yeah. You you picture uh, Burgess Meredith from Rocky. You know, exactly. <laughs> it's really almost something exactly. like that. Uh, but you know, it was actually good advice because I I think if I have one you know watchword that I've carried through all my writing, it's make it sing. Uh, whether it's 
the most mundane advertising copy, catalog copy, uh, my essays, uh, just about everything. So what did you want to be when you grew up when you were younger? Did you always want to be a writer? Uh, no. Uh, when I was growing up, I really didn't know what I wanted to be. I, my main strength back then was art. My uh, teachers used to save my drawings in hopes that I'd become a famous artist someday. And I thought, ah, I wouldn't be able to make a living as, as, as an artist. So, so what do I do? I become a writer. <laughs> and uh, I, I guess when I was in college, you know, as a history major, I thought of becoming a history professor for a while. And then by the time I started doing, you know, detailed uh, uh, term papers, I thought, oh, you know, I can't really see you doing this for a career. Mm -hmm. You just you know, get bogged down in footnotes. I hated that footnote mentality. Everything you said had to be justified by you know looking up somebody else's work. And then when I was in grad school, I discovered H. L. Mencken, who was a prominent journalist, uh, especially during the 1920s. That was the, his heyday. And I was just so impressed by not only his writing style. He had the most colorful writing style of, of any journalist I've ever encountered. Uh, but it was the, the freedom of his ideas, the way he expressed himself. Uh, I mean, he, he could be a little insulting at times, definitely on PC you know, by today's standards. But I, I just, you know, it was just such a breath of fresh air after all the scholarly works I had been reading up until then. And so I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to write, you know, commentary like that freewheeling commentary. So how did and you get so, your first uh, your first job? Well, yeah, my first job was yeah, not exactly it. Because you said it was, it looked like all the stuff in the paper was not what you expected. No, oh yeah, I mean, I I just assumed that, say, you know, if the New Yorker wanted a staff writer, they'd be advertising in the New York Times, and it just just wasn't so. You know? uh, so th that's essentially how I backed into my career. Uh, I went from the trade magazines to uh, working in the publishing industry. Started out as an editor because, you know, I was always good at grammar and, uh, you know, punctuation, all those, you know, fine points. And uh, it was, you know, it was okay. It wasn't the most exciting kind of work. And then the president of the company saw that I could also write. I don't know. He must have seen some samples of, of my writing. And he's, he had just fired their, their in-house copywriter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I remember looking at her work and thinking, oh, my God, I can't believe they're using her as a, as a copy. Why? What, what, what did you see that was bad about it that you knew? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, she just, just had no, no instinct for getting, you know, any persuasive thoughts across. I mean, aside from the fact that she was also a technically bad writer, uh, just, you know, it was just the, the copy just kind of sat there. And at that point, I really didn't know anything about, you know, writing advertising copy. I was just, you know, I was, I was a decent writer. And, you know, I had a kind of persuasive quality to my writing. Uh, but I had a lot to learn, and I really didn't have any mentors. Uh, you know, I mean, what the, about the, the trade magazines? What, uh, before that, yeah. um, when you were writing there, what kind of work were you doing there? Oh, it was just sh you know, mainly short articles. Uh, they'd give me press releases, and I'd convert them into articles, uh, that, that sort of thing. I'd occasionally be sent out to a conference or you know, something. That, that was the exciting part of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But yeah, I, even for the most mundane uh, features, like you know, opening a new uh, business park in Kissimmee, Florida, I try to make it sing, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was a, it was a good lesson, I have, I have to admit. So what was you know now? Then you move on to the that was Barron's, the educational, the the publisher, yeah, later yeah, on. That, yeah. That, that's where I became a copywriter. So when did they decide to bring you know promote you to the copywriter? That was, uh, I'd say, within my within the first year. Oh, okay. um, I stayed there for seven years total, and yeah, I think by the end of the first year, I was already their their chief copywriter. We used to use outsiders as well, freelancers, uh, and so yeah, I'd also have to edit the work of, of other people. Um, but yeah, it was it was a good experience. But as I said, you know, I had no mentors. I had to learn everything on my own. The, the best piece of advice I got from the president of the company was see what the competition is doing before you start writing our own copy, you know, uh, because, you know, I might be making claims that fall short of what the competitors are doing and then it wouldn't be effective. And so th th that was a good lesson. But, so how did yeah, you learn? I, I how did you learn if you about, had no mentors? 
How did no, you learn? No, I didn't yeah. know anything at that point about, let's say, emphasizing benefits over features. Uh, in fact, the copy I wrote there was, was pretty feature heavy. I mean, they were mostly like, you know, test prep books, college guides, and so on, although we did branch out in, into other books as well. Um, but yeah, I, I had to discover all that on my own. I guess I, I read a couple of books on copywriting on the side. And I uh, always wanted to compile my own list of uh, you know key phrases that, that, that I could use, uh, which, which kind of led me to, to, my, to my big book. Words that sell. Yeah. yeah. So what made you decide, because that's a big undertaking, when did you decide to, okay, I'm going to just write a book? Because you could have this just as your reference on your computer that you use exactly to help yeah yeah I mean I'm a big procrastinator so I hadn't even gotten around to compiling my own list but what happened was a former colleague and this is where connections are important former colleagues started working for another company and they had wanted to do a thesaurus for copywriters and that's that's how the project got started mm. and so I thought yeah it's something I've always wanted to do myself they gave me one month to put it together if you can believe that oh, wow uh, I don't know how I did it. I, I stayed up uh, nights. Uh, I mean, not not all nighters, but you know, we'd say up until three in the morning or whatever. Right. Work. Uh, compiled as many you know brochures and uh, sales letters and direct mail packages as I could, and uh, you know, gleaned phrases from those. Came up with uh, a lot of my own. And uh, yeah, it, it you know finally became a book a month later. Well, not I mean I finished it a month later, and then it was published later that year. But yeah, the amazing thing for me was when I wrote it, it was under the assumption that it would be a book for other professional copywriters like me. You know, yeah. very limited market. Yeah. Uh, and it turned out that it was used by people throughout the business world. I had no idea. Uh, you know, CEOs were using it, uh, uh, people in public relations, uh, salespeople, like, you know, like even, you know, sales representatives would be using it. Uh, so that was, a, that was a pleasant surprise. And, you know, the fact that it became an established reference book just, just floored me. Yeah. So how did you put it together? Um, you said you took different direct mail packages. Where were you getting all the, the materials? And I'm curious... Oh, they, they, they'd, they'd come, well, I'd, I'd get enough of them in the mail, and I, th I remember going to the library, I don't know, I guess looking through magazines and, and so on, yeah, I, I, I did a lot of that, but yeah, it all had to be done within one month, I don't know why it was such a tight deadline, that's just, just the way it was, <laughs> and it, 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 it concentrated my faculties, you know, so maybe, maybe it They probably thought if you, they gave you more time, you'd take more time or something. Yeah, right. right. So how did the title come about? Words that sell. It's a great title. You know, I, I, I honestly don't know. Yeah, it was my title. Uh, certainly sounds better than a copywriter's thesaurus. <laughs> um, yeah, it was just you know, one of these little flashes of inspiration. I thought, yeah, that, that sounds that sounds good. Yeah, sounds compelling. <laughs> so you have the book handy so you can kind of show, show it? Yeah. Let's see. There it is. Can you see it? Words, Words that, that sell. sell. <laughs> yeah. You know, you often, Rick, here. You know, I get lots of marketing newsletters, and it it's brought up quite often of people using it as a reference. Yeah, um, they actually mention it, huh? Yeah, and there's different sections. I was wondering if you can uh, talk about a few of them. I know there's four sections. There's grabbers that get attention. Yeah. There's descriptions and benefits that create appeal, clinchers to win over your customer, and special strategies that seal the deal. Um, how do you, I mean? How do you even? There's such a broad range of words that sell or the, the source copywriters. How do you even categorize yeah. it, decide to categorize it into different well, sections? I went through the kind of, it's a kind of natural progression as you write copy. I was thinking, I guess, in terms of sales letters, especially. Okay. Uh, you know, where you start out with, say, either an envelope teaser or a, you know, a little teaser at the, at the top of the letter. Um, and I mean, yeah, some of them are just very elementary. I mean, free is always good, but you know, no obligation ever. You know, so that uh, people don't feel they have to commit. These are these are all grabbers. Uh, you know, bonus offer, last chance, uh, all these things that will make the reader take notice and you know, kind of in invite them in. Mm -hmm. And then we get into the uh, you know features and well. I call it descriptions and benefits. 
there those are arranged alphabetically that's where the book really works like a thesaurus okay um say you want another word for fast i mean you know it's not a very appealing word so you know there are a lot of synonyms and I, I include not just synonyms, but also phrases that kind of fit the category. Yeah. I start out with synonyms like instant, immediate, swift, speedy, fast-paced, punctual. And then I get into phrases like in a matter of weeks, in no time at all, mm. uh, you know, tears along, uh, out, uh, whizzes past, <laughs> quick turnaround, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. And then I have uh, cross-references to other lists in case you know, you're not satisfied with that list or you can always move to another one in the book. <laughs> so the grabbers didn't – so I'm, I like hearing your mindset. Okay, so you kind of yeah. went down the sales ladder, grabbers that get attention, yeah. then you look at description benefits, and then the next one you have is clinchers to win clinchers. over your customer. Yeah, that's when, when you close out your message – a big mistake uh, a lot of copywriters make, especially novices, is they leave the reader just hanging. You know, they think, okay, well, I've presented the features and benefits. That's all I have to do. And you really have to motivate them to take action. Uh, it's like you, you have to sort of raise their energy level to the point where they're in from where they're indifferent to where they'll actually respond. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I have several. You know, another. You know, number of categories under clinchers. Call to action is probably the most famous, uh, the most, the most uh, uh, essential, especially if you're writing letters. Um, like, I urge you to act at once. It's important that you respond promptly. I can't wait to hear from you. I mean, these would be for, for sales letters, but right. they're, they're all purpose uh, calls. To what are a couple others in there? I, I feel like I use some of these in my emails, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just to uh, friends, I mean. Um, like respond at once for even faster service call blah 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 just reach for your phone um now of course you can do it online as well uh to take advantage of this remarkable opportunity simply blah 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 you know i'd leave blanks to mm -hmm. where, where you know they mm -hmm. can fill it in uh so it's you know it's and yeah that again that's just one category under under clinchers right you also have i've minimizing risk which is important uh Oh yeah. Again, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was reading people about people to make sure they're not going to be, you know, blowing an investment on on something that they won't be satisfied with. So, you know, no obligation to buy anything ever. You may cancel at any time. Uh, keep only the blank you want. You know, so it's you get the idea. Yeah, yeah. Hundred percent satisfaction guarantee. Yeah, exactly. Is one of them. Yeah. Right. Right. And then the last is special strategies. Special strategies, yeah. I, that sealed that the deal. Of, yeah, well, it, it these are really just special phrases that sort of fall, you know, fall out of the that sequence going from uh, grabbers to clinchers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, enhancing your company's image, justifying a high price. Uh, that's like, aren't you worth it? <laughs> right. Uh, take a full year to pay in case it's a really high price. You know. Uh, knocking the competition, which I mean, it's not exactly unethical, but you know, like don't be fooled by blank, 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 you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Don't fall for. Yeah, right, right. We make your life easier was another one I, I wrote down that I liked. Yeah. Um, so then you revised it. So what did you decide yeah. when you revised it? Because that one you wrote Good in question. 1984. 1984, yeah. I took a look at it. Um, back around 2004 thereabouts uh and i thought you know it's really i i wish i'd had more time to to fill it out more, more than 30 the, days. the original book was kind of skimpy i mean after all i i, I had to, i had to complete it in one month and so not only did i i want to fill it out with more more categories more words in each category uh but i also wanted to weed out some of the phrases that sounded like they came from, uh, you know, the 1950s, uh, like, you know, seeing is believing, that sort of thing, <laughs> which I thought, yeah, you know, I'd read it and kind of squirm a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because consumers today tend to be a little more jaded than they were back in, uh, you know, the days when I was growing up. Uh, I think... People had, were, were more naive back then. They had more of a sense of wonder and innocence. And I think you know, millennials especially tend to be a little bit more cynical. Uh, so uh, you, know, you, have to, you have to 
you, you, you can't just hit them with the, those uh, old catchphrases and expect to sell anything. Yeah. So what did you, what do you remember that you added that was, that you're like, this needs that for the, the revised version? Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, you know what I, what I really had to take into account was the presence of the internet, uh, which simply wasn't there when I wrote the first book. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was that was a major adjustment, you know, having to add uh, you know internet specific phrases mm. uh, about ordering online and and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What um what do you common mistakes do you find? that uh, copywriters make or people make when they're they're writing copy because obviously you were not only writing it but you had freelancers coming in you had to edit edit copy right and not only that but i had to teach myself too <laughs> right um i think that the biggest mistake is what i call chest thumping and it's an easy mistake to make you know you're proud of your product or your company and you say we are the greatest blah 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 you know and uh... you expect people to respond to that when really the emphasis has to be on how you're pitching yourself to the customer what you know what are you providing the customer that will make them respond you know what can you do for them right. and so it's it's really like a it's almost like a paradigm shift you know that you're you're looking at it from the point of view of the consumer ins instead of yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then when did more words that sell come into play? Uh, that one it was actually before I revised the original words that sell. Maybe that was my attempt to say, well, you know, okay, like, words that sell really isn't complete enough. I want to add something to it, but it's it's a, a very different book. Um. I wrote it so that it, as as a kind of supplement to the original words that sell, uh, like especially if you're what you want to target your message to specific audiences, let's say the youth market, or um, you're writing you know financial uh, advertising, you know diff different types of advertising, subscriptions and so on. So in other words, you it's not so much a thesaurus as uh, you know, it's broken up in, into categories of, of different types of advertising. Plus, uh, <clears throat> you know, words and phrases you can use to enhance your copy in, in, in different ways. You know, make it more sensuous or uh, more hard-hitting, uh, you know, like act use action verbs. And so I have a list of action verbs, that kind of thing. Yeah, and besides uh, just having the thesaurus, the words, though, you do have some kind of a crash course on copywriting in there, too. Yeah, yeah, a very elementary one, but yeah, it gets the the key points across instead of having to read a two hundred and fifty page book on. Right. It, you know? What books would you recommend besides your own uh, for copywriters or people who want to learn more uh, copywriting? Uh, well, there's a, a classic one uh, with a very dry title called "Tested Advertising Methods," and it's probably about fifty years old, but it's great on the essentials of you know the psychology of of uh, direct mail, especially advertising. Mm -hmm. Um, then there's a more recent one by actually somebody I know personally. Uh, his name is uh, Drew Eric Whitman, and he wrote a book called Cash Vertising, hmm. um, which is really full of all kinds of uh, secrets you know, used by ad agencies and so on. You know, it, to you know, it was to get behind the psychology of, of, of advertising as well. Mm -hmm. Nice. And so then what's up? Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend both books. Yeah. yeah. I hadn't heard that one. I'll have to check yeah. that out. Cash yeah. advertising. Mm -hmm. um, so what were some of the other turning points, Rick, in your career? Because you worked um, large stints at those companies. Yeah, right? seven years at Barron's and then uh, later 14 years at Daytimers. Yeah, so tell me about Daytimers. Well, uh, yeah, that was uh, an interesting experience. I'd been working, you know, in New York on, uh, well, actually on Long Island. I was living in New York, but commuting out to Long Island for Barrons. And my father, who was always very solicitous about my career, he always wanted me to make more money and so on. And I, I was kind of a stick in the mud that way, you know. I didn't care. But uh, yeah, he uh, showed me a want ad for a job out in Allentown that was paying me uh, probably fifty percent more than I was making at, at, at Barrons. I thought, hey, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. And yeah, it was Daytimers, which was the original personal organizer company. They, I mean, it's almost an extinct kind of product now. They're still around, uh, although they're just a product line now. They're not a company anymore. They got absorbed into their parent company. Um, but anyway, I went out there for an interview, uh, did well. I think they were impressed by the fact that I'd written words to sell. And uh, 
when I started working, I thought, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? I, you know, I, I looked at their catalogs. They're the, the, the driest. <laughs> I thought, I'm going to die here. You know? <laughs> and you know, look, you're describing different page formats. Okay, we have the, the two page per week format, you know, which is good for people who don't have uh, a lot of appointments. And there's the two page per day. And uh, oh gosh, this is okay. I don't know I'm, how you make that sexy. Interesting. Yeah. And yeah, that was the the challenge, and it was it turned out to be a fantastic challenge for me because I did transform their copy into something that was you know, readable and interesting. I have to you know I have to thump my chest a little a little for that. Uh, and I was inspired by some of the catalogs that were coming out at that time. It was really like a catalog renaissance. You, you had Jay Peterman, you had Banana Republic, very creative uh, copy. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, you know. Okay, well, they have, they have you know interesting, sexier products, but I could use that same approach for our products, mm -hmm. and 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 I did. Uh, especially, you know, we had le leather binders, so I could use my imagination there. I compared one binder to the 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 bomber jackets used by World War II fighter pilots, you know, that, that kind of thing. And it was true; it was, it was a distressed leather, and you know, it, it, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking how you made yeah. this two-page versus week planner. How do you even dress that up or make it sexy? Yeah, yeah, it all it goes into your your you know your needs. You try and make it as personal as possible instead of just a dry description of the format. Uh, it would be something like, you know, do you have you know more appointments than you can fit on a single page? Well, you know, and you, you make it you know something that they they can relate to and say, oh, I need that, you know, and uh, yeah, it, it, it worked that way. Because there's only so much you can fool with with that, right? I mean, you could fool the description and um, the picture. Is there like a head? Yeah. Were there like headlines there or? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I would add a little creativity to the headlines. I can't remember any off the top of my head now because it's been years. But yeah, it wouldn't just be you know two page per day format. It would be. Uh, you know, fill your busy day, you know, using our, our two page per day form, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You can put a benefit in there and, uh, you know, that leads them into the body copy. And there, there would be a picture of the format, of course. So with day but, timers, you were there for 14 yeah. years. What were, yeah. what was another big lesson you learned there? Um, I had, um, an assistant, uh, she was, you know, I was copy chief and uh, she was a, assistant, uh, I guess what was she? I guess just you know, copywriter, and she. But she was very experienced uh, in the business of advertising. She she also had, uh, was a freelancer at one point, and she told me that you know you you really emphasize emotions over intellect, mm. and that was something that it was really a kind of flash of inspiration for me. Because I mean, okay, I was I was creative in my copy. I wrote well. Um, but yeah, I tended to still have this kind of cerebral quality to my, to my writing that, yeah, I guess, you know, having been a history major in college and having wanted to write uh, columns like H.L. Mencken, you know, it, 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 it sort of brought me back down to earth. And I think it Im improved my overall writing, not just advertising, but, but everything else. So I have to give her credit for that. So write more emotional. Yeah, appeal to people's emotions, to get an emotional response from them, because that that's essentially what makes them buy. So how do you do that? Like, if that's not someone's inherent nature, like, let's say they just think intellectually, they think factual, yeah. what did you do to get your writing to be more emotional? Good question. Um... Because I don't, th I, I don't know if I, I naturally my... think like that. I think I would naturally go to factual. Yeah, things. yeah. Well, I I have a pretty wide range. It, it, it's funny. I'm, I I wouldn't consider myself highbrow. I'm, I'm I'm sort of an omnibrow. You know, I can I can watch Popeye cartoons with my son and enjoy those, and uh, I, I can read uh, you know volumes of history and and still enjoy those. So it was just a matter of you know, sliding down to a different area of my emotional repertoire. Yeah, I'm just and, thinking, uh, how can someone do that? Like, what did you do to get a mindset or to make it more emotional? Because if you see it the way you see it, you wouldn't even notice, oh, this needs to be more emotional. You'd just think, oh, this is good copy. Or this, well, yeah. at, as I did, yeah. yeah. And I mean, I th you know, it, it probably did work on, on, on some level because we, we're writing for 
what I thought were executives. Th this was another revelation when I was there. We, my uh, first boss there was somebody from the Franklin Mint, and he had a very lofty, pretentious style of you know, writing, which even I recognized. I mean, it just seemed a little too puffed up for me. Uh, it was, you know, it sounded like it was more from you know the 1950s, early 60s, and. Um, so I thought, yeah, that's yeah, that's really not the the way I I would approach it. Uh, he he didn't last very long there. <laughs> he had a, a couple of very ambitious pieces that that bombed, unfortunately. Uh, and I I could see it coming. It was like a slow motion uh, train wreck. You know? <laughs> there, there was one piece in particular, uh, a big brochure it must have been about 16 inches by by 12 or so, something like that it opened yeah. up it was about 15 pages uh you yeah, know selling our, our basic products and it was using einstein as a theme as they had the art department draw like a cartoon depiction of einstein on the cover and one of the headlines was it doesn't take a genius to use it and so i think okay well why are they using einstein i mean it's like like Einstein would be the non-user. Right, right. You, know, so. <laughs> you put like and, a baby and, or something on the cover. Yeah, right? I, I, yeah, right. Yeah, I don't yeah. know, but yeah. Then you couple that with all the overinflated copy, and uh, so I mean, I, I, I could see overly cerebral and ineffective copy. You know, I, I could recognize it. Uh, I mean, mine was sort of you know middle ground. I still thought we were you know writing mainly for executives, and that the style should be sophisticated, kind of semi-formal. And then I realized, you know, the prize were being used by a whole range of people in the business world. And so I, I came down to earth a bit. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to think. Of, so was there anything you did to get in like an emotional mindset? Like, did you watch Popeye cartoons or did you uh, <laughs> just give it? Did you give it to that lady? Like, what do you think of this? Or did she pick apart what you like where you could be more emotional or? Not really. No, it, was, it, it wasn't. It wasn't like a ma major seismic shift or anything okay. like that. It was just. Uh, also, I, I, again, I was I was reading those uh, really creative catalogs that were coming out at the time, and I saw what they could do, and so I kind of emulated their their example, and uh, you know, sort of again went into my own emotional register. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think it's an important point to make. Um, you know, because appealing to someone's emotions is probably why they buy more than yeah. facts yeah. Um, yeah, and back it up with facts. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also, so anything else from the, I had another question about your next book, but about yeah. daytimers, that would be any fun, uh, more stories from, from daytimers days. Oh, that you uh, learned or lessons. A couple. Well, let's see. Um, at one point there was a, a coup. We used to have separate marketing and advertising departments, and the head of marketing decided that she wanted to run the advertising department as well, and just kind of folded into marketing. She persuaded the president, so it came to pass. And she also thought that my associate should be promoted to an equal position with me because you know she was a woman and the head of marketing was kind of a feminist and she thought well why you should have this guy in, in, in charge and he's younger than his associate and so on and so I was I was just just devastated I mean here I'm the author of words that sell and uh, somebody wanted to be like H.L. Mencken and there I'm, I'm demoted to associate copy chief you know it's the same level as, as the other woman and at least they didn't give me you know they didn't cut my salary or anything like that but what I did in response was I mean I was already in a, in a kind of a good place at that point because I just had the Cynics Dictionary accepted for publication. I thought, well, you know, if it doesn't work out here, I'll just become a full-time author and, you know, just abandon the advertising business. And so there wasn't a whole lot at stake. But even so, what I did was I doubled my efforts. It was like, you know, trying to, I'll, like, I'll show them how good I am. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I just kept at it for. Uh, it took about three or four years, and we had a new marketing vice president come in, and he just he just was so impressed by my work. He said, "You know, this is ridiculous that you should be associate copy chief," and so he bumped me back up to copy chief again. And uh, yeah, that was a proud moment for me. Yeah. You know that I, I persevered and actually you know came back. So, when did you become cynical? And I want to hear about the cynics <laughs> the cynics dictionary. <laughs> 
because you still seem like such a happy-go-lucky person. I, I oh, that, I, that's only that. That's you know the the cynic the cynic is the flip side of my personality, which is just as genuine as as, as the jolly side. Believe me, I have, I have my my dark moods. You know, um, no, I, what, what turned me into a cynic, I think, was uh, you know coming out of college and just discovering how dismal the job prospects were at that point. I'm sure you know today's graduates can identify with that too. I think it's even worse now. You have all these you know college graduates not only saddled with debt but having to work as baristas at uh, Starbucks and yeah. so on. Uh, so that that really did it for me, and so I started reading, and, and of course, H, reading H. L. Mencken probably didn't help because he was one of the all-time great cynics himself. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I developed that uh, this kind of, you know, just a kind of, you know, dark but humorously cynical side to me. And especially, I think, you know, after a couple of years writing daytimers copy, I thought I, I need another outlet, you know, like. It, Okay, I'm writing all this upbeat advertising copy. I have to express my 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 darker, more brooding mm -hmm. side, and so I started compiling all these definitions. Uh, at first, I started doing it on index cards, and then I would just stay after at work. Everybody would leave for the day, usually very promptly at five o'clock. I tended to stay later anyway, uh, but I'd be working until eight thirty, nine o'clock. You know, putting the definitions in a separate file on my computer at work, and uh, every so often the, the night watchman would come by and he'd read my latest definitions and chuckle. And I thought that was a good sign. <laughs> so, what's an example of something in the cynics dictionary that that's oh, cynical? I can't even picture you saying something cynical. So, okay, what, here, what's a uh, boss? Uh, a personal dictator assigned to those of us who live in free societies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <That kind of thing. laughs> CEO, corporate ego in overdrive. You know? <laughs> okay. Now I'm getting a taste. What else? Yeah. <laughs> what are yeah. the other favorites from the Cynics Dictionary? Oh, let's see. A funeral home. Uh, a stately manse occupied by transients who continually receive visitors but lack the energy and inclination to entertain them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have this thing about death and humor, you know, <laughs> for some reason. I guess a bit better than uh, screaming in terror about thinking, <laughs> thinking about it. I think he should have been scared. You're staying late, writing cynical, <laughs> having cynical writings, like you're going to blow the place up or something. <laughs> Maybe that's my cynical side. Yeah, no, know. no, it was, uh, there was nothing really that subversive about it. Oh. Um, uh, I, I felt a little guilty for using the company computer. I didn't even have a computer at that point. This was like the early 1990s, uh, so I just used the office computer. Um, but yeah, it was, it was it was it was just exhilarating. I don't know, just the idea of you know a kind of safety valve from having to write uh straight laced you know direct mail advertising copy all day yeah uh because some people you know like if you work for an ad agency you generally get to work on products or you know uh, projects that do uh kind of satisfy your creative urge at, at daytimes i really had to kind of you know make my own creativity and uh, i needed more than that mm -hmm. so with the cynics dictionary Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's like a dark humor type of, book. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I guess, so, you know, you became cynical when you saw the job prospects. Do you do yeah. anything? You have a son. Do you uh -huh. do anything with him so that he doesn't get that shock that you did? Or, or I'm curious of how you, um, raise him in a certain way based on your 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 experiences and, and everything like that oh well i went out of my way to give him a good springboard for uh you know a a, a, a joyous life as much as possible i i you know i, I do i'm starting to cushion the the, the blows at, at this point because you know i've told him you know, you might not always be the smartest kid in the class. That happened to me. And I remember, you know, having to, to think about it and say, gee, because I was used to identify myself as being the smartest in the class. And then at one point, there were all these kids coming from other school districts into our high school. And suddenly I, I wasn't the smartest anymore. And it, it really, you know, it really set me back uh, for, for a while. And so I'll, I'll prepare him as, as he goes along. You know, I, I, again, I'll, and... Yeah, if I'm still around uh, in Knockwood, I'll prepare him for the 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 
problems of the the job market, you know, whatever field he decides to go into. Yeah, I'm always curious. I mean, from a selfish perspective, because I have young yeah. kids too. So yeah. I'm curious how you handle that. And also when you're saying like, well, I had such a good childhood, maybe if it wasn't so good, you wouldn't be as <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, I, I think, no, I, I don't regret having a happy childhood, but it would have been nice if I'd been prepared, I think. You know, just so that's the main thing. I want him to have a happy childhood, but I'm also going to prepare yeah. him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't want him to have an unhappy childhood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I like to talk about, Rick, some of the successful campaigns, why they were effective. And you talked about some of the, the catalog renaissance with Jay Peterman. Yeah. And uh, I like how you incorporate the bomber jackets and the leather binder. Right, right. <laughs> um, you also have some work with some health service companies. And yeah. I know when we, we chatted uh, before the, the recorded session, mm. you were kind of alluding to how you handle outlandish examples. So I wonder if you talk a little bit about, there's like a knee pain campaign and what you include, what you don't include, how okay. great, how great do you go when yeah. including certain examples? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good example. Um, it was you know, one of these sort of alternative medicine companies. They they had uh, a kind of ointment that you could use, uh, you know, to, to cure your knee pain instead of having to go under the knife. Uh, yeah, they had a picture of this really gory uh, surgery, you know, showing a knee that's been cut open, and they don't let this happen to you. <laughs> you know, kind of an alarmist approach, which I thought was, I mean, not not the approach I would have used, but I I, I went with it. I thought it was it was okay, but. Yeah, it's uh, it's a question of ethics. I am a real stickler for ethics in in advertising. Uh, you know, it's certainly it's okay to, to tout the virtues of your product, but you don't want to over tout them. You know, you know, credibility is just so important. You know, you, you you it's like a necklace. You snap it in one place, and all the beads go scattering to the four corners of the room. And you, you certainly don't want that to happen. Uh, just from a practical standpoint, you know, that's, you know, ethics aside. Uh, so, yeah, I saw some of the claims that they were making, and, I mean, I, I used most of them where I thought they were going a little over the top. I cushioned them a little bit. Uh, so, I mean, I think, you know, overall, it was a nice compromise between doing what they wanted and, you know, preserving my own integrity as, as, a, as, a, as an ethical copywriter. Yeah. How do you decide that? Um, like, what do you remember any examples of what you cushioned or what you uh, kept in there? What were some of the claims that uh, they were making with the knee pain? I think it, it, it's hard for me to come up with uh, specific examples, but it was things like, you know, it will cure your knee pain in you know so many weeks, and I. You know, I, I don't like def definite you know, statements of predicted success like that. So I, I don't know. I just rephrased it in a way so it didn't sound as if it was, uh, you know, simply a matter of, of time. That you know that, that it, it works in in most cases, or you know, it, people have reported you know such and such you know kinds of results from it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also about you know not every campaign works what are some that you remember that didn't work you mentioned one of your colleagues that was a good example of the yeah right the einstein, the einstein uh, picture, yeah. picture and <laughs> uh, what were some other ones that didn't work and why because often we learn a lot the most from those campaigns that don't oh work. gosh uh well there was one i did as a freelancer um a uh, co-founder of a very prominent bookstore chain approached me and he was he was starting a new business venture. It was going to be a kind of aggregator of uh, news stories online, um, you know, so that people wouldn't have to go to a different source. I thought you know it was a good idea. I thought, and basically all he wanted me to do was come up with an, a name for the company. It was a kind of branding project which I'd never done before, and I I, I you know told him so ahead of time. And so he gave me a few tips, like you know a good trademark name use as few different letters as possible, which was, you know, kind of a new concept for him. But I thought, yeah, Coca-Cola, look at that. It's all C's and O's pretty much, you know, and, and you know, fairly short. And so I, I, I came up with a whole list of names, like, uh, <laughs> ranging from the silly, like, Buzzbug, you know, a lot of repetition there. I thought it was kind of cute, actually. 
and uh, Cosmos using a, a K as the, uh, the the first letter because yeah, he also said that yeah you you can't really trademark uh, a commonly used word which would explain why you see so many quirky spellings for for product names right. Um, but anyway, I gave him a whole list, and he, he liked my thought process. You know, he showed the list to the uh, his colleagues, and eventually they just went with one of their own. I think they eventually called it My Wire, uh, which I thought, wow, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I think it just it, I kind of sank out of sight gradually. Uh, <laughs> but it was a shame. It was, it was a good idea, I thought. So how did he find you? Because it's a very prominent uh, co-founder of a bookstore. Yeah. Store. Yeah, um, I guess uh, through words that sell. Uh, I, th I think he had seen words that sell, and uh, you know, wanted to contact me as a, as a result of that. Yeah, the book gets around. I'm really, I'm still astonished to this day. How do you, how do you think it's so? How did it sell so many copies? As I said, it, because it went beyond just the base that I had assumed, which would be professional copywriters. It just people throughout the business world uh, just seemed to gravitate. To it because yeah it didn't really occur to me when I was writing it that say you know entrepreneurs who are starting out they can't afford an ad agency and so they have to do their own writing and so it's really it's a handy tool for for people like that and I mean it still surprised me in a way that CEOs would would we use it yeah the CEOs of corporations uh, but apparently they do <laughs> I mean was it from word of mouth you think or do they do like lots of press releases or uh, no, no, there, there wasn't a whole lot of promotion. I didn't do a single interview for it. Um, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it, it just sort of took off. And originally, it, it was sold strictly through direct mail. Really? Yeah. Uh, it was a, a, a little company on Long Island called Cadillac, uh, C-A-D-D-Y-L-A-K. I don't know if it's still around. Um, this was before Caddyshack, or was this before, like, the movie Yeah, came? Uh, yeah that was found before the movie okay. came out. Yeah. <laughs> And they, they were mainly, mainly into business products. I think they were just starting out do, doing books. Yeah. And, yeah, I got, you know, a former colleague started working for them. And, uh, you know, her boss wanted to do a thesaurus for copywriters. And so that, that's what they approached me. So, anyway, at some point about, I think, when they saw that it was taking off, they licensed the book to an actual publishing company. When, mm -hmm. I think, it was Contemporary Books for a while. And then McGraw-Hill took it over eventually. I guess it makes sense that words from sell would sell through a direct response marketing company, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> do you, what did they do to sell it? Do you know? Like what kind of mailers I, they yeah, sent out? I don't out? remember. That. You know, I really don't remember. I, you know, they included it in their catalog. I don't know if they did any special mailers just, just on my book. Uh, but yeah, just somehow or other it, it took off. <laughs> Does Cadillac still exist or is it? Uh, yeah, I was, I was wondering. I, I don't think they do. It was uh, one of these little family run companies. And I, I, I'm i guessing they're, they're not around anymore. Mm -hmm. So some of your favorite headlines of all time. Obviously, words that sell goes without saying. What are yeah. some other of your favorite headlines? Oh, that, that I wrote? That you wrote, yeah. Or, yeah, that okay. you wrote, yeah. Well, that, my, my personal favorite, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want it engraved on my tombstone, but uh, it was one that worked. It was while I was working at Barron's. We had a little children's book uh, for, it was meant to be read by parents to their toddlers as they were you know, being toilet trained. It was the book was called Once Upon a Potty, and my headline was a moving experience for your little one. And uh, that got it into the bookstores, and after that, it the the book took off. It's it's still around after you know over thirty years, I think. Oh my god! Uh, it, was, it was. I mean, it's a useful book to begin with, but I, I I like to think that my book kind of gave it the momentum it needed. Why do you think that headline. that uh, headline works so well? Well, it, 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 it's quirky, just a little off It was marketed to bookstores, or the headline to, was marketed to bookstores, or who was, who was reading yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was marketed to bookstores, yeah. Uh, I guess, you know, the buying departments. Um, and uh, <laughs> I guess our sales reps would also take a catalog around when, when they made their personal visits, and uh, so, you know, it got spread around that way, too. <laughs> you know... You're so interesting, Rick, because you're so jolly. I can't get past yeah. the fact that you have the cynical side. I want to hear about extremely dark chocolates. Oh, but yeah. Well, 
Yeah, I mean, describe it, it, to people what that is, and and yeah. You know. Yeah, after I wrote the Cynics Dictionary, I started a, a website called the Cynics Sanctuary. It was, uh, you know, I started to promote the book because my publisher wasn't really being too active in that department. Didn't get a lot of uh, press, which kind of disappointed me. And I guess, yeah, looking back, yeah, humor books t tend not to get a lot of reviews. Uh, you really have to just kind of catch on. And yeah, so I started this website, and one of the features was a monthly tirade, as I called it, that I, I would write for it. These were humorous, yeah, sort of darkly humorous essays. And oh, I had, I had the time of my life writing those. I, I just loved it. Um, and uh, eventually, I approached my agent, tried to get them published in book form. And her response was, you know, I love your work, Rick, but, uh, you know, collections of essays tend not to sell. And it's it's true. You you almost have to be a celebrity these days. You know, it's you know, stand up comics tend to you know be the the essayists of our time, and uh, it's kind of galling. But I uh, wonder the, if you should the change the cynics dictionary. Should be like the stand up comics cynics dictionary or something, because I could definitely see stand up comics using some of those definitions. Do you I, I don't know. I, I really don't know if it would come across as well in person. Uh, because, I mean, you know, they lack spontaneity. They're very carefully constructed. Uh, they're almost almost like mathematical, you know, where you have to you know, have a kind of surprise ending and it just, you know, to build up to, to the, the build up to that twist at the end. Uh, I mean, at one point I thought of doing a, you know, an audio version of it and I thought, well, I don't know, I just, it's, it's, it just sound kind of repetitious. You have, you know, 900 and some definitions one <laughs> after another. <laughs> you know. I'd listen to uh, it. So, but anyway, the, the essays were a different story though, because there I had a little more free reign right. and, uh. Yeah, you know, when I found out that you know publishers weren't going to, yeah, the, the typical response from the publishers was is similar to what my agent said. They, yeah, we like his writing, but does he have a platform? In other words, is he already well known? Does he have a built-in audience? And yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I had my website, but that really wasn't enough. Uh, nothing I've written has gone viral. You know, that's something I really haven't conquered yet. <laughs> I don't know what the secret is. Uh, but anyway, so I finally put them all together myself. I'm, I'm going to be doing it in three volumes. Uh, first one is Extremely Dark Chocolate. That's where I have my, my darkest essays about, you know, aging and death. Yeah, tell and me about one of them. I want to hear about one of them. Tell me about one of them. I want to hear one the them, dark side. Uh, it's yeah. called A Grave Matter. Uh, it was about this call. It started out with a call I, I got just, you know, from a, a guy who said, we're going to offer you a piece of free real estate. I was like, wow, how, how is this? It, it turned out to be a burial plot. <laughs> so I, mean, I thought, oh, this, this sounds like fun. So yeah, they invited me. It was a local cemetery. So I went on the tour with them. <laughs> then they pointed out where I'd be buried. It was, <laughs> it was like this grassy knoll. They said, yeah, and then you know, the deer gathered there at night. I thought, gee, it sounds inviting. And I'd really... <laughs> And then he took me into the mausoleum, and I was surprised. You know, I think of mausoleums as being kind of cramped and dark. There was like this brightly lit art gallery, almost. You know, the 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 the, the, the uh, I don't know what you call them. They're not really sarcophagi. The the, the you know, they, they were stacked about six or seven deep. You know, going all the way up to the the ceiling, and. Uh, yeah, he had told me that, yeah, he's seen bodies removed after 10 or 15 years that were almost as fresh as the day they were put in there. <laughs> what? So I thought, gee, that, that's a condition Why that the body them? would aspire to. <laughs> Why were they removing them in the first place? I guess if, say, uh, you know, say the, the surviving spouse uh, moved someplace else and they wanted to be buried together eventually, you know. Okay. Yeah, and they're, they're, what's interesting is they were part of a chain. I had no idea there were chain cemeteries. Uh, so, in other words, if you if you decided to sputter out somewhere in, in Nebraska, you could get buried in one of their cemeteries out there, you know, <laughs> under the same contract. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I have to write an essay about this. And it was a fun one. <laughs> I like that one. Any other? Yeah. I want to hear another dark one. Uh is like uh, there's one I called aboard the extinction express it started out with the contemplation of the ivory-billed woodpecker which 
people think may already be extinct. They're not sure. They've uh, there have been a few rogue sightings, but they're not you know they're not really authenticated. And I thought just sort of like you know when you haven't seen a colleague at work for a, a, a while, you say whatever happened to old Marv? You know is he still no? He was fired eleven months ago. <laughs> you know. And uh, it's, it's, I started thinking about like products that, you know, we might have been raised with, like Bosco. You know, back you know if you if you go back that far, you know, it was a chocolate syrup that you, you'd add to milk. And is like is Bosco still with us? Did it, it did it go extinct at some point? You know, and then from there I segued to a series of conversations I used to have with a good friend when I lived in Allentown, uh, Pennsylvania. We used to hang out at this uh, local eatery, and all our conversations were like a variation on the same topic, like, you know, how much worse can it get for, for, for people like us, you know, liberal arts graduates? <laughs> uh, we, we all have to point and click for a living. Uh, like, and, yeah, we started comparing ourselves to these, like, Victorian poets with three names, like... Uh, you know, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Algernon Charles Swinburne, you know, like we're, we're going to be as extinct as those guys, except we won't be famous, you know, we'll just be obscurely extinct. <laughs> and uh, so, the, and, and, and the thing is, we're, we're, we're unwilling to, to change ourselves to the point where we could avoid that kind of extinction. Like we were going to stick to our old values and uh, no still read our, our musty old books and, and so on. <laughs> That's that's so random, Rick. So you're going from a woodpecker, yeah, to all the way to there. <laughs> right, right. So yeah. random. Yeah. Well, that's what I love about writing essays. You know, one idea kind of you know leads naturally to another, and then you feel find yourself in strange places. But but then it all ties together at the end. Love it. It's so yeah. interesting. Um, yeah. and you know, Rick, I always ask. This kind of goes into my next question, which, um, with Inspired Insider, I always ask about your lowest moment uh, and how you pushed forward through it, the tough times? Um, yeah, personally, I'd say it was back in 2008 where it was uh, uh, just a series of calamities one after another. Uh, first of all, there was this, this, well, let's see, what came first? Oh, my wife left me first. Uh, wow. had, my son wasn't even four years old at that point, and I, I was just, yeah, just, I was just like, oh my gosh, I can't That's devastating. This happening. Yeah, yeah, we're still friends, uh, and I mean, I can understand why she left. Um, you know, she had kind of like special needs, uh, and um, we, and you know, she, we, you know there there was yeah you know, the difference of personalities. I mean, we we clicked in terms of chemistry, but yeah, it just didn't work out for her, and so so she left. Um, and then let's see, I couldn't get my essays published. That that was around the time I was submitting those essays, and I was, it was starting to dawn on me that. Oh my gosh! After my brilliant start with the Cynics Dictionary, it looks like it's going to come to a halt. You know, right here. And then on top of that, then there was the crash of 2008. I lost half my nest egg, which I was depending on. And so, anyway, what got me through it was, well, partly my sense of humor that 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 helped, and yeah, having a delightful young son who who lived with me half the time that 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 definitely helped too. But I compared myself to this Armenian artist. Uh, Arshil Gorky. Uh, he was uh, an abstract expressionist, uh, you know, worked during the 1930s and 40s. He had the most terrible year of anybody I've ever come across. Uh, he was in an auto accident that paralyzed his painting arm. Mm -hmm. He started becoming ill-tempered after that, so his wife left him. Um, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And then to top it off, his studio burned down, destroying all his recent work. And he finally hung himself. But I thought, Jeez. you know, you, you have to compare. My year wasn't anywhere as bad as his, so I, I can I can get through it. So, that is dark. That is a dark, yeah. <laughs> dark humor. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that's in your essays. You know, I I haven't brought that up here. That that would be a good one. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's all. That's devastating. It, yeah, and there was also a great Swedish movie from, I think, the 1980s. It was called My Life as a Dog, about a little boy who uh, his mother is dying and he gets shipped to stay with relatives. Uh, and they're just, you know, again, he has some a miserable time. His, his dog is taken from him and probably put to sleep. He's not sure if the dog is still alive. 
And yeah, he says you always have to compare. Once I heard about this guy who was walking across the across the stadium and got a javelin through his chest. You know, oh, <laughs> you, you always have to compare. <laughs> I think you're one of the only people who could say that, and it makes me smile rather than yeah. like want to cry. I don't know. Why. Yeah. Um, so on the flip side, Rick, yeah. what's been uh, one of the proudest moments? Well, aside from having the Cynics Dictionary accepted for publication, that really, I mean, I wasn't expecting such quick results. I mean, I knew it was a pretty good book, but, yeah, yeah when I heard it was accepted by, uh, you know, mainstream, you know, New York publisher, I thought, wow, that's, you know, that's fantastic. Uh, I remember my, my, my colleague stormed out of the room when she heard about it. Why? She was, she was an aspiring author herself and hadn't had such luck, so... <laughs> um, and I've had other high moments too. Um, well, let's see. When uh, I was working at Daytimers, we had hired a new president. He uh, was making the rounds in the building, came into my office and said, Oh, I see you have a copy of Words That Sell on your desk. That's one of my favorite books. <laughs> so uh, that made me feel good. Yeah. Uh, that, that was a really, that, was, that the book was really established. Yeah. I love that. And yeah. uh, then to one of my. Uh, the, one of the projects I'm proudest of was actually it was a pro bono project that I did again while I was still working at Daytimers. Uh, there was a local theater in Allentown that used to show quality movies, uh, you know, independent films, foreign films, and so on. And uh, they they were about to go under. They, you know, I'd go there and there would be like you know 15 people in the audience. And so the head of the theater got a group of people together and said, okay, we really have to start promoting this film program. And so I volunteered to write their annual uh, membership mailings, uh, which I did. And, you know, it was something there was advertising I could really get into because I was personally invested in. I loved that that theater and uh, it worked. I, you know, every year our membership went up uh, every year I was associated with the program. What'd you do? And there there's there's huh? what did you do with the program? What'd what did you do I for do? them? Yeah. Oh, well, I was used, used to write the membership mailings. I was also on their film selection committee. Uh, but yeah, I was, I was considered membership chairman. This is the only advertising I've ever written where I got to sign my own name. Really? <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd write the letters and yeah, I'd sign my name to them. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's it, it's fitting because they really were personal letters. I I, you know, I really wanted that place to survive, and it, it did. So. What did you put in there that uh, you think? made it do so well? Uh, I think getting people to experience what it's like in the theater. And yeah, most of them knew it, were familiar with it, but I think it needed to be brought home. You know, you, you take your seat in the theater, you look around at the old Art Deco, you know, carvings on the walls, and you sit back and, you know, watch a film that you can't see at the local Cineplex, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. And that, you know, we, we need your support to survive. So yeah, it's, it was it was a lost cause, but uh, yeah, we managed to rescue it. So Rick, what's some of your best advice for people out there writing copy? They want to improve their sales messages. What words of uh, advice do you have for them? Um, well, I, again, I use my old colleague's advice. You know, appeal to people's emotions. Um, it, it also, also depends on whether you're an entrepreneur and you're you know writing for your own company or whether you're a hired gun. If you're an entrepreneur, I'd say let your own voice show through. Let your personality shine through. I'll never forget, I don't know, this might have been a New York thing, but I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, thereabouts, there was uh, an ice cream man named Tom Carvel. Uh, had you heard of him mm -hmm. out in Chicago? No, out in no. Atlanta? Hey, so it must have been a local thing. Uh, he had this raspy voice. He was a, a Greek immigrant, I think, and he used to do his own commercials. And I thought, Gee, what? No, at first I thought, gosh, he's like his own worst advertisement. But then <laughs> it, it, the, the, the commercials became compelling. And I thought, you know, this guy's really kind of endearing. You know, he's like an uncle, you know. And it, he was using his own voice, very sincere, and it it worked. You know, I mean, those those campaigns were around for 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 years. Uh, 
So it, there's a good example of, you know, if, if you have your own company, you know, no matter who you are, whether you're a PhD or you, you've never been to college, you, you know, use your own voice and it'll, it'll work for you. Don't be behind a big company facade. Just kinda... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, don't sound institutional. I think that that's a mistake a, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs yeah. make. Yeah, you, you want to differentiate your, your voice. Rick, I have uh, one last question. I appreciate your time. But before oh, sure. I ask, tell people where they can find you online, what they should check out. Okay, well, for my advertising services, my copywriting, uh, go to richardbayon.com. Um, it's yeah, you know, it's sort of a rudimentary site. It's it's like my business card in, in in cyberspace. But you can find out about my advertising and copywriting services there. Uh, I also write a, a political blog. That's one one of my uh, missions. I don't make any money from it, but it, it's something I felt I'd do because this country is just being torn apart by the polarization. I mean, my gosh, it's like we're we're devolving in, into into two separate countries, you know, left and right. And so, yes, the new moderate, I'm trying to <laughs> not only criticize the extremists, but you know, try and find common ground that, that, that people can agree on. I don't know what, what impact I'm having, but I'm doing my best. I think I, there's an article about, like, why let ISIS have all the fun or something? What, what was that one? Well, why, why let the extremists have, extremists why, why all, the extremists fun. have all the fun? Yeah, right. right. Yeah, yeah. And it, it occurred to me about halfway through that maybe they're really not having such fun. They're, they're definitely dominating the news. Uh, they're dominating the, the, the message boards online. Oh, I mean, some of the message boards that I see, it's just, you know, it's, it's really like, like the Civil War all over again, 150 years later. But then I thought, are they really having fun? They all seem so angry. You know, the, the, the left-wingers seem angry, the right-wingers seem angry, and... Neither branch seems to regard itself as being American. You know that they're, they're. It's almost like we're splitting up into little mini nations, uh, especially with, with all the, the identity politics on the left, and then you have the you know the Tea Partiers on the right. And uh, I, I think you know we just need to find common ground again. What made you decide to start that? Uh, let's see, I started it around two thousand seven. It was during the. Bush administration, the second Bush administration, and yeah, Bush was a polarizing figure. Uh, then you had you know what they called Bush derangement syndrome. Uh, you know the the liberals were all going a little nutty because uh, you know they, they'd start mocking his grammar and everything, and uh, uh, yeah. And then uh, once Obama was elected, it shifted to the other side. You had all this hysteria on on, on the right. You know the, the Tea Party faction emerged, uh, and so yeah, it just that that kept me going. So what what do you what kind of stuff do you publish lately, on the new moderate? Uh, well, there, yeah, there was the one about the extremists having all the fun. The the latest one was about that shooting down in uh, North Charleston, and mm -hmm. yeah, how, yeah, I mean it was a, a tragedy, but there were mistakes made on both sides, and it it's also a mistake to frame it as a racial incident because. Yeah, it seems like the only cases we hear about on the news are where you know white cops kill black men, and that it's that's just not so. That you know there are I think twice as many whites being killed by cops. Uh, I mean, not, not to take away from you know what the black community is going through, but it you know we don't want that distortion coming across on the news, which which will only fuel anger and 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 race hatred. Yeah, it's, it's totally non-productive. Yeah. So my last question is, what are you working on lately that you're excited about? Uh, getting my second collection of essays together. Uh, this will be the a, dark a chocolate. different theme. Yeah, after Dark Chocolates. Uh, this one will be more like news stories. Not, not really news stories, but yeah, more like Mencken-esque commentary from the turn of the century. And... I think it's enlightening because you know the '90s. I think of as like the last happy decade. It was the the golden age of yuppie dumb, Seinfeld, uh, Friends. You know, it was, it was kind of a happy time. And then all of a sudden, you know, 2000 comes along. We have the dot com crash, 9/11, uh, the Bush presidency, the war in Iraq, and these essays I wrote just just by coincidence straddled that transition and i think it makes you can, you can see the progression you know from the kind of you know loopiness of, of the 90s to the darkness of the early uh 21st century i'm, I'm gonna call it lifestyles of the doomed <laughs> 
So it won't be there, like there'll be a picture of the Titanic on the cover. <laughs> um. So are you done with it? No, I'm not done. With it. I'm about halfway through. Okay. Uh, but basically, it's, it's an editing job. I, uh, you know, when I kind of you know weed out some of the lesser essays and write little introductions to, to yeah. most of them yeah. to kind of set them in in context. Rick, so, I appreciate uh, it. That'll be a fun project. <laughs> this has been fantastic. Everyone should check out your site. Check out Words That Sell and, and much more. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was fun. <laughs>